Hey, welcome to the Healthy Postnatal Buddy Podcast with your postnatal expert, Peter Lapp. That, as always, will be me. Today, I'm talking about the three worst, air quotes, people in the health and fitness industry. And I class health and fitness as one industry. So that includes doctors in this case. Um, And by worst people, I, of course, don't mean the person themselves. I'm talking about their message and the way they go about their business, right? Um, It'll be a fun episode. This is the one that will get me into trouble. (laughs) I just know it will. Uh, But just listen. That's all I need you to do, right? It'll be fun. Here we go. Hey, welcome to the Healthy Postnatal Body Podcast with little old me. This week is little old me again. Next week I've, I've got interviews lined up, so that'll be fun. You don't need to listen to my dulcet tones just by themselves. They'll get interrupted by other experts in their field, right? Won't that be fun? I am today joined by Buddy who's sound asleep and farting. So if you hear an edit, it's because I had to open the room. Kitty is the one snoring in the background and Lola Bear is just sound asleep and behaving, you know, like an ideal doggy would for the next hopefully half an hour or so. Uh, This is a podcast for the 30th of January and like I said, this is the one that's going to get me into trouble. Um, Last year I did one on my three favorite YouTube channels for health and fitness. Um or for strength training and all that sort of stuff. And I get asked to do a top three regularly, you know, top three exercises for fat burning, top three exercises for diastasis recti, top three exercises for shoulder rehab, all that sort of stuff. And I might do some more of those, but I always think the problem with doing a top three is that it oversimplifies things a little bit and that makes it seem like there are three magic solutions to a particular problem. And we know especially things like diastasis recti is massively complicated, right? Uh, That's why I've done like 50 hours (laughs) discussing diastasis recti already. Um, But I did think, you know, there are three people or in the health and fitness industry that have a message that is problematic. And the way they go about their business, I think is, is problematic or the way the marketing department, in, in the case of number three, promotes them is, I think, problematic and leads to polarization and, and, and problems when it comes to people addressing health and fitness issues. Um, so again, this is not about the, the person, because I've never met any of them, and I actually really like two of them. <laughs> not the first two, but, uh, <laughs> but the... Um, the, the problem with this sort of stuff is that as soon as people try to monetize and try to sell things too much, that they start to cherry pick stuff. And that's kind of where we, uh, where, I, where I really struggle. Um, because, you know, they have a large platform. And I always say, if you have a large platform, and I don't, <laughs> but if you have a large platform, you have to use it wisely. And you have to make sure that what you're putting out there is accurate and that you're not just putting information out there to make money. Right, let's start with my number one. I'm not going to do a three to one countdown. I'm start with the person who in my mind represents the biggest problem in the health and fitness industry, Dr. Michael Mosley. I've said this before, I don't particularly care for Dr. Michael Mosley's, uh, Dr. Mosley's uh, products. Because that's what it is. He's he's a product, right? Um, And every year he has a book to sell. In this case, you know, this year, I I came across this the other day. Someone sent me uh, an email. I discussed this briefly last week that someone has sent me an email linking to a Daily Mail article. Because the Daily Mail always promotes this sort of stuff because they they really uh, get clicks, right? At the end of the day. You know, stupid weight loss plans always get clicks. Um, and Dr. Michael Mosley is always more than happy to uh, to oblige. Now, 
of course he's a GP, right? He's qualified in I think 20, 30 years ago. So he's been he's been for a while. Um but the problem is that he's more he's more a publicist and a self-promoter than he is a doctor. And you know, his last book, the keto, the fast 800 keto diet, is a prime example of this. So I'm going to talk about that for a little bit, um, because I think that really illustrates my point of the problem I have with um, Dr. Mosley and his type, because he's not the only one, right? Like I said, it's not about the people. This is about, yeah, I think he's a hack, but, <laughs> you know, everybody that promotes his stuff is is kind of just not helping the health discussion. And again, like I've always said, I don't do a lot of weight loss on this uh, on this podcast or indeed on, on, on anything, but we promote health. And if you promote health, the fast 800 keto plan is pretty much a surefire way of, you know, getting people sick and getting people sick really quickly. I'm talking mental health and all that sort of stuff. So last year, uh, Dr. Michael Moser, you might remember, remember him from the fast two, the, from the five two intermittent fasting diet. Uh, he did a program on the BBC about, and that's usually how he works. He gets a program out, and then on the back of that, he has a book coming out. He did that with the 5-2 intermittent fasting diet, where he basically says you eat whatever you want for five days, and then on two days, uh, you can you drop to 400 calories or something like that, and you lose weight. Um, of course, yeah, you would lose weight because you're dropping to 400 calories, but we'll come to that in a little bit. Now, last year, or the Two years ago, he couldn't put out another book because, you know, if you put out a weight loss book every week, uh, every year, people stop buying it. So his wife put out the Fast 800. And I spoke about the Fast 800 before. <sighs> a, f- a way to lose weight fast by dropping to 800 calories a day. Yeah, that's just not a good idea, right? We can all agree that that's stupid and, and it's, that's, it's not the message we should be sending out to anyone. Anyone in the health industry that puts out that sort of messaging is really not helping the debate with regards to weight management and what health really, really looks like. So last year or two years ago, she brought out that book and, you know, this year more money needs to be made. So we need something new. So interestingly enough, Dr. Mosley, um, came, and that's me scrolling back to the top of the page, because I want to quote him for this. Um, He came across new research, right? Quoting him here. Remember that? We're going forward. So I was fascinated to come across new research by two Australian academics, which helps explain why so many of us, me included, seem hardwired to overeat. Well, first of all, you know, you're not hardwired to overeat. That's just not a fucking thing. Pardon my French. Professors David Raubenheimer and Steve Simpson from the University of Sydney. And these are these guys are golden, right? These guys are qualified up to the hint. So again, no issue with them. Arguing their book, Five Appetites, that we don't have one appetite for food, we have five. Now, the, um, in 2020, uh, Professors uh, Raubenheimer and Simpson um, put out a book called Eat Like the Animals, What Nature Teaches Us About the Science of Healthy Eating. And they expanded on the protein leverage hypothesis. And bear with me, because this is is quite an important bit where we see where where Dr. Mosley fails. Uh, I will continue in this whole thing to give people their proper titles and all that sort of thing, because I think it's important. And, you know, he went to medical school, so he was a doctor. Um, right now, remember when Dr. Mosley said that, you know, he recently came across this, um, protein leverage hypothesis is not recent. It's from about 2005. Um, uh, the satiety theory, which originally came out by Dr. Ah, Jesus, I should have had this ready. Dr. Susan or something. Um, I can't remember. I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. I think that's important. Um, anyway, she came out with that. I'll give credit in the, in the podcast notes. 
she came up with the uh, strategic theory in 1995. So this stuff, and she basically said that you keep eating until your body is full, and that depends on two factors. That, that, that was what her theory was. It depends on two factors. Protein and or fiber content. Fruit. So she found that highly processed food, Pringles, biscuits, and all that sort of stuff, McDonald's, all that sort of thing will lead to people overeating because the body doesn't recognize that it's full because it doesn't hit the the saturation point. So it doesn't hit that point where your body recognizes the cues that it is full, right? This is what they talk about with um, intuitive eating a lot, right? But your fullness cues. So she's saying... And her, her theory was that unless you get enough fiber or unless you get enough uh, good quality protein, and it can be an animal source and it can be a vegetable source, but it has to be good quality and can't be overly processed, that you never get those fullness cues and therefore you will overeat. Um, and there's something to that. We know this kind of is, that makes sense, right? In the same way that I always say, I can eat 5,000 calories of pizza or 6,000 calories of biscuits, but I can only really eat about, I don't know, 1,000 calories of chicken breast and then I'm done. <laughs> and it's not because I don't like chicken breast. It's just because my body's saying, dude, I'm full. I've had enough, right? Now, the protein leverage uh, hypothesis, which is, uh, like I said, by uh, Professor Raubenheimer and, and, and Simpson, and I might well butcher their names, by the way, but, um, you know, I've never met the, the the good people, and therefore I'm not sure how they pronounce. So I'm thinking Robert Heimer is, is about uh, is about right. So they've been working on this from I don't know 20, 2005 roughly. That's when the protein leverage hypothesis came out. So that instead of focusing on the fiber element, it basically took the two elements from uh, the satiety theory um, or satiety, however you want to pronounce it depending on whether you're American or British or German or whatever. Um, they took two bits and they focused on the, pro, uh, on the protein bit. And they've done tons of experiments into this uh, for, since 2005. So when that book came out in 2020, like I said, uh, I'll link to the book as well, by the way, um, or at least I'll link to the title. I'm not in the business of selling books. Um, when the book came out that said, Eat Like the Animals, and what nature then teaches us about the science of healthy eating, they basically expanded on, on that protein leverage hypothesis. That said, if you get enough good quality protein, you will feel full. And if you don't, then you won't. Um, now, there is, I know that will, a lot of people find, and I was re writing a blog post about this, and I kind of stopped. People find this when they do a keto-type diet. Keto and Atkins and all those sort of diets are kind of easier to follow because A, they're straightforward, eat meat. B, they allow you to eat meat, and that's a big thing in the West. And C, if you eat good quality meats, they will keep filling you fuller for longer. I think it's the MNS range even that is called fuller for longer. It's high-protein sort of stuff. Um, high protein on processed food. And I'm not saying you should go high protein, by the way, right? I'm not selling that side of things. Because if you remember, the original theory included fiber and all that. And that's important. Always get your fruits and veggies, people. Don't let these bastards tell you anything else. Right, so then, of course, you know, good old Dr. Mosley, he needs to put a new book out. Um... A new dieting book, which kind of, again, for me, is always a bit of a clue as into his, people's credibility. As in, how often do you change your advice on diet, on weight loss especially, right? And he doesn't change his advice. To be fair to him, he's remarkably consistent. Eat less. But, <laughs> but the way he does it just doesn't make sense. Anyways, he, he presents this in that, in that bit that I read out, presents it as it's as if it's brand new knowledge. And I'm sure that it is to him, right? But that doesn't mean it's new knowledge, right? 
he was fascinated to come across new research by two Australian academics. Well, this is not new research. They've been at it since 2005. So it's new to him. And I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt here. Because I would argue that the sentence that says, I came across new research, implies that the research has only recently been done. And, you know, I'm guessing Dr. Mosley um, um, looks into these things when he, when he writes his books. And that he therefore knows that the research isn't really new. Right? The research is... Uh, is reasonably established. At least 25, I can go back 25 years and I haven't even traced it that much. <laughs> so so it's, it's new to him. It's a shitty way of phrasing it because it means that he's discovered something, right? That, that's, that's what it sells. That's what it sells. Um, then what he says is, you know, eat too little protein, they say, and you'll be tormented by cravings and likely overindulge in all the wrong foods, whereas on a higher protein diet, your appetite can be satisfied on far fewer calories. Now, this is true. However, now we get to the crux of it. Right? The amount of protein people require in their diet is, as Professor Raubenheimer and Simpson concluded, um, the percentages that are recommended are anywhere between, I don't know, 15, 8 to, 8 to 15 percent of, of, of body weight um, of, of, of your total meal consumption, which is way too low, right? Which is why even clubs like David Lloyd have, have peddled the healthy eating 40, 30, 30 split. Right, 40% uh, carbs, 30% fats, 30% protein. Because we know that that kind of works. Again, based on this protein leverage theory, uh, hi uh, hypothesis. So, what that means is that what Michael Mosley tends to do, Dr. Mosley tends to do, is he then represent, misrepresents the basics. He takes a lazy approach and basically uses something someone else has already done, in this case, his wife, <laughs> right? Because he wrote the 800 book last. Um, and then he pretends to incorporate this new research, with, which it isn't, right? Into his well-established routine. So the protein leverage hypothesis says that you need to aim for something around 30% of your daily calorie intake coming from protein. And that then you will feel roughly full, right? The, and that's a deep sigh on, on my end. What Michael mostly extrapolates from that is that you can translate that into a low calorie diet, which is of course complete and utter horseshit. That is just not how it works, right? Say you are a typical man or woman. So female, 2,000 calories a day. I'm still using those shitty numbers. Everybody's different, right? Don't believe the, the, the general 90% will... It's, it's accurate for 90% stuff with regards to this. Everybody's calorie intake and calorie requirement is different. Some people is a bit more, some people is a bit less. The bigger you are, the higher your base metabolic rate will be. So don't take this as, as gospel. But based on 2,000 calories a day, 30% protein intake, right, that's fair enough, is roughly 650 calories worth of protein. Now what Dr. Mosley then does is say, I've put out this fast 800 keto book and you will never feel hungry again because, and that is a quote, by the way. Um, on, right, so... Our recipes will get you burning fat, but without going hungry. Now, if on my, meta on, on my maintenance calories, I need 650 calories worth of protein, then dropping to eight 900 calories a day, like I said, bad idea, don't do it, um, would mean on a 30% calorie intake, I only get 300 calories a day coming from protein. Right? So always, I'm missing my hunger cues. How is this not obvious to everybody? <laughs> right? My fullness cue 
is missed because I, I hit that at round about, around about 600 calories. We established that if that is my true base metabolic rate, and you know, again, all intuitive eating stuff is built around this, so it's important to realize this. If my base metabolic rate, is, if what my body needs to maintain and to feel healthy and to function optimally is around about 2,000 calories of high quality food in an ideal world a day, and 600 of that needs to be needs to be good quality protein, 300 isn't going to cut it, right? So I'll still be hungry. And that's where Michael Mosey, Dr. Mosey tends to fall apart. He, he, he sees an idea and then he sells a book <laughs> based on really quite hacky, a hacky approach to science. And then we will look at the book, right? The, when we look at the, and I haven't bought the book. Don't worry, I'm not giving that man my money. Um, but I did check, I did give the Daily Mail a click. <laughs> or five or ten hours, or often I read this remarkably stupid article, which I will also link to in the podcast description. Right, the fast 800 keto plan in a nutshell, and see if you can see the problem with this. Stage one, rapid weight loss. Well, that's a win, right? Trying to lose weight, do it rapidly. How 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 does he get to do that? Eight to 900 calories a day for two to 12 weeks with protein add-ons to take you to 1,000 calories when needed. Well, thanks very much there, Michael, uh, Dr. Mosley, sorry. I'll need that every day, thanks very much, because I'm never going to hit <laughs> my fullness kill. Um, you know, even a 1,000 calories a day for 12 weeks, are you out of your mind? And he says this will lead to rapid weight loss. Yeah, it would do, because you're only consuming by at least a 1,000 calories a day. This is not counting uh, adding in exercise and, uh, and all that sort of stuff, right? Uh, this will lead to rapid weight loss, so yeah, it would. And health benefits such as falling blood pressure, blood sugars and blood fats without leaving you hungry. Well, let's break that one down. Health benefits such as falling blood pressure. That depends what my blood pressure is, thanks very much. Blood sugars. Well, I'll grant you there will be, if I eat like a normal human being, they'll, I will have fewer sugar spikes. Yeah, if I'm on a relatively high protein diet. And blood fat, well, that's debatable, right? Are we still on the saturated fat thing? I don't know. Without leaving you hungry. Well, I already we already established I'm gonna miss my hunger cues, so I'm still gonna be my, my fullness cues, so I'm still going to be hungry. And following the recipes with your blood packed full of flavor and nutrients are based on a 50-50 rule. More than 50 grams of protein, less than 50 grams of carbs a day, you should lose around 2 kg a week. So now, <laughs> God help me, now not only we know from um, the oversimplified calories in, calories out rule, that 500 calories a day leads to around about a pound worth of weight loss uh, a week, right? The law of thermodynamics applies. I mean, it's oversimplified and there's a lot more to it, but fundamentally calories in, calories out still matters. And it's important to use a simple example here. So we know that if we cut 500 calories a day, we lose about a pound a week. And again, ballpark, not accurate. So ignore this. As soon as you hear it, ignore it. Um, double that is your thousand calories a day. So we lose one kg a week. We don't lose 2 kg a week, right? This is also, by the way, depending on what your base weight is, where you start. I've said before, I, I have one weight loss client left as a PT who started on 380 pounds. Um, even he didn't necessarily drop four pounds every week. <laughs> you know how much that is? Four pounds every week, that's just brutal. Um, you can only sustain that for a short period of time. Two to 12 weeks, eight, 900 calories a day. That is just, a, it's a nightmare on all levels, right? That's just stage one. God love you. Stage two, as he says, intermittent fasting. So we're still back on this fucking calorie control with regards to intermittent fasting. Pardon me, there will be a lot of swearing in this particular podcast because this sort of messaging drives me up the wall. Again, I'd happily grab a coffee with Dr. Mosley. <laughs> it's not about the guy. Right? It's about his message and, and, and the way this stuff is sold. Eight to 900 calories on four to five consecutive days a week and more relaxed but portion controlled approach on non-fasting days. 
increasing protein to 60 to 80 grams. Yeah, again, come on, dude. So on, on two to three days, I get to eat like a normal human being on, on a maintenance. And the rest of the time, I'm still more than halving my daily calorie intake. I'm a guy. I need, dude, I'm a, I'm a personal trainer. <laughs> I exercise regularly. I, I, I move a lot. Uh, 900 calories a day isn't, isn't going to be enough. It just isn't. Um, and then a more relaxed but portion controlled approach. I still count, you know, I'm still dieting on, on, on days two and three. So I'm intermittent fasting on day one, uh, sorry, days one through uh, what, four, to f- four to five, so say Monday to Friday. And then on the weekend, I get to eat like a portion controlled human being, increasing protein to 60 to 80 grams, which for me isn't anywhere near enough. Because, and I've done protein for weight loss and protein for weight gain and maintenance and all that before. I need more than a gram of protein for my uh, to maintain um, to maintain muscle mass. So you know, I'm 94 kg. So dropping to 60 or 80 grams is 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 a deficit. Still on those two to three days, I'm still in a deficit. Now the problem with this is not so much that it's yet another shitty weight loss book because of course it is, right? Um, that that is just the way it is. That's that's what he sells. Problem that I have with this stuff is that it's it's a lazy approach that misrepresents the very basics of of the science that it's allegedly based upon. Now, Professor Raubenheimer and Simpson have put a lot of work into this stuff. They've done this for the past fifteen years. So to boil it down into a very oversimplified, shitty diet plan that will fail. This will fail for most people. This is not healthy for most people. Most people cannot drop this low. And most people, do, it, you can't stick to this. 900 calories a day, it's it's slim fast all over again. It's just so remarkably lazy. Um, yeah, just don't do this stuff. And the, this is why my Dr. Michael Mosley is, is, is my number one in the UK at the moment, at least for shitty messaging. And, you know, before I'm, I'm going to get shot in the neck for this anyways, because people always point out that doctors are not part of the health and fitness industry. And, you know, never a truer word has been spoken in the case of some of these doctors, because you're definitely not in the health business if you're selling this stuff, right? That, that is my problem with this. These are people with medical degrees. They know better. Come on. Right, it's I shouldn't every single year get emails about Dr. Mosley and and similar hacks. Anyway, that's half an hour. Can you tell this is is gonna be a long, this is gonna be a long one? Brings me on to number two, which is Dr. Asher Larmi. Now you might know them. Um, they're identify as non-binary, by the way. So I will use the they them pronoun as much as possible. Uh, if that's confusing to you, then you know, tough luck. If that's how they want to be known, that's fine. Uh, they call themselves the fat doctor. Um, and again, this is not this is the one that's going to get me into trouble, by the way, because it always that whenever you go and look at the work of anybody <laughs> to do with health and uh, health and every science and all that sort of stuff, for some reason people don't listen to the message anymore. People think you're going after the person. And that is, of course, not. The way at all. I've never met uh, Dr. Larmy and I've no idea what they're like. They might be lovely people, right? Um, I, I just don't know. Um, however, let me let me start this by saying this is not about health at every site. Anybody who knows this podcast, who's listened to the podcast, who's read any of the blogs or seen any of the information, we all fundamentally agree you can't just judge people on weight and size, right? There's also no doubt that there's significant medical bias based on race, gender, weight, and all that sort of stuff. If you're looking to see, to find more information on that, if you think it's all shit and you want an entertaining 15 minutes, look at the bit that John Oliver did for last week with John Oliver years ago, before this was even... um, even a big thing, right? The health at every size is, is fundamentally, it's a very important thing. When you go to the doctor, 
and you say, I suffer from X, Y, Z, the doctor shouldn't immediately jump to the conclusion that you being overweight or obese, and we'll separate those terms in a little bit, um, is the cause of your problem. You could be having a heart attack, for all you know what I mean. So we have to make sure that things check out, that that is not the starting point. We all agree. I also, you know, I've used this example an awful lot. Used to in this example an awful lot. The the judgment, we all agree, I hope, everybody listening to this agrees, that the judgment associated with fatness, when you see a fat person walking into McDonald's buying a Big Mac, like that client I just spoke about um, a little while ago, when you see them buying a Big Mac, you can't go, ah, that fatty piece of shit shouldn't be eating a Big Mac, because you don't know where they're coming from. Right, like I said before, my client goes from three hundred and eighty down to three twenty, and then decides to have a Big Mac. It's, it's just a snapshot. I've told this story before about this personal trainer friend of mine, who is in pretty good shape, and is one of the most knowledgeable personal trainers I know. Um, but she has um a Big Mac or a McDonald's, God knows what, every Friday at six o'clock. That's her schedule. That's how she eats, and it's not for me, right? The rest of the week, she eats different stuff, but 6 o'clock is big back time, right? And she likes that. That's, that's her That's her yum. And I always say, uh, like I said on the Fittest Fat Kids Fat Kids uh, Kid podcast, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum, right? I always find that diet is something that I'm not judging anybody's diet. But this person who's in shape, this is a person who trains, she lifts weights uh, competitively. Um, for a competitive weightlifter, you need a certain build. You need to have at least mass on your side. You can't be completely and utterly ripped with low body fat percentage. You need, to... we're talking powerlifting, not bodybuilding. So she has a McDonald's or Burger King or whatever it is at six o'clock. And the same client that's been with her for five, six months that had tremendous results with her that gets stronger and bigger and, 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 and whatever she wants every week drives past that McDonald's every week uh, after work. And every week on a Friday, sees this person eating her Big Mac and then cancels her personal training sessions with uh, with the client, uh, with, with the PT. Because she says, I can't, uh, I can't train with somebody who doesn't live <laughs> what they preach. Right now, let's, you know, you know when we say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that's horseshit. A picture is just a still. It is just a temporary glimpse into a relatively, probably fake. So sort of these days on Instagram, a fake sort of situation, right? Um, this person was getting results. The PT is in good health and good shape and has a shit ton of knowledge. And that's all you need in a good PT. I always say this. Don't go to the nearest ripped guy. Don't go to V-Shred just because he's shredded. Go to Athlean X because he's better than V-Shred. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that, that, that is the thing. Go with the, the person who has the most knowledge. And, you know, you don't just... If you don't know what someone's journey is, you don't judge them on that. So this is, again, this is a diet-neutral sort of, sort of bit. And like I said... You know, that sort of thing is obviously unacceptable, right? We don't judge people for being overweight, or at least we shouldn't judge people for being overweight. I'm sure it happens, right? However, the science denial that comes from people like uh, Dr. Lamy is is a problem, right? Um, I, I dealt with things like this before where uh, comments like there isn't a single study that shows being overweight uh, is bad for your health. Comments like that before from Vergi Tovar and, 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 and all those uh, all those people. But blogs like, you know, uh, they, uh, Dr. Larmy wrote a blog called uh, My Big Fat Apology Part 1. Uh, and I'll just, the same way that I did with Dr. Mosley, I'll just go and, and dissect this a, a, a little bit. It says in there, let's start with the basics. Obesity, and she used asterisks for the word E, which fucking annoys me. It's a medical term. It's not offensive. Um, does not increase your risk of dying from COVID. 
There's a definite link between the two, but that's all we've known right now. Even public health in the midst of that, uh, evidence is insufficient to draw any real conclusions, and that was back in July. Since then, there have been studies that have shown that there's absolutely no impact on hospitalization, ventilation, or uh, ventilation or death rate. Which begs the question, why? Why is there a link between body mass and serious COVID when one is not causing the other? And this, in her wor uh, their words, sorry, um, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the bit that nobody wants to talk about because it's awkward and uncomfortable and impacts people in positions of power and authority. Because serious COVID-19 is also linked to poverty, and they're right on this, right? Uh, I think so, but we'll get to them. It is linked to race and ethnicity. It is linked to level of education. What do these groups all have in common? Well, amongst other things, they have all been shown to receive poor quality hair care. Uh, healthcare, sorry. <laughs> What's well, like you say? Surely it can't be possible implying that the medical profession does not provide equal care for all. Why, well, yes, yes, I am. That's exactly what I'm saying. Right. And this is important. Like I said, we have already established medical bias is a thing. We know this is a thing. And we know that this is a real, real problem. But the study she linked to was posted on the JAMA network. Um, and this is, again, this is her link and I'll link to it. Right, this is because this is very, very important. Um, when they say, uh, when Dr. Larmy claims that the bit, um, why is there a link between body mass and serious COVID when no one, one is not causing the other? So they said, uh, they said, sorry, obesity does not increase your risk of dying from COVID, right? When that's, and then they say it's linked to race and ethnicity, it's linked to level of education. That same study that they link to, conclusions and relevance. In this national cohort of VA patients, most SARS-CoV-2 deaths were associated with older age, male sex, and comorbidity burden. Right? So, indeed. Many factors previously reported to be associated with mortality in smaller studies were not confirmed, such as obesity. So they have a point, according to this particular study, and I'll show you in a little while why this study is not the most uh, relevant one, um, the most accurate one. Black race, Hispanic ethnicity, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, hypertension, and smoking. So they are claiming in this study that race isn't part of this. Dr. Limey says it is linked to race and ethnicity based on this study, but the study itself says no, that's not at all a thing. And this is the problem, right? When quite often when people link to studies, they know you're not going to read the study. The cherry picking and saying obesity is not to blame, but then immediately blaming the other things is, is just insane. Now, of course, you know, there's an agenda here. That's always what the case is. Now, they, of course, picked one of the few studies that, so, that so, said that those factors did not play a part. I will link to a study in Nature, a study in Science, the CDC obesity data report and all that sort of stuff, that shows clearly, clearly and demonstrably that, that when you're obese, non-healthy obese, and I'll, I'll, I'll stipulate that point, all right? If you're a non-healthy obese, then that comes with risks for COVID. The link is well established by now. More and more studies have been done into this. So the point isn't just that they are being, Dr. Larmy is being borderline dishonest with her information, uh, but that they cherry pick information, they cherry pick from the conclusion of the study that directly, that backs them up on one end and directly contradicts what they claim on the other with regards to them assigning blame for other stuff. And that is just, you cannot do this. This is one of my problems with the fat acceptance and the health and every size movement when it comes to extremists. Um, is that, or more extreme views, let me put it that way. Extremists is a rather dirty connotation. Apologies for that. Um, with extreme views is that activists tend to, tend to go too far a little bit. Um, and... To throw health at every size and, and fat phobia or whatever you call it in with homophobia or racism and all that sort of stuff always seemed to me to be a step too far. And I know someone will write to me and say the books have been written. I'm like, yeah, I've read the book. The book is a, 
there's quite a lot of hogwash in that particular book. As in, that doesn't it doesn't mean racism isn't a thing. It doesn't mean that the ideal that as in the ideal for white men for a long time has been skinny white women or that proportionalism or, or anti curviness or whatever. But there is a difference between that and say and being morbidly obese or being obese is bad for your health. Right? We have to accept this, guys. If we cannot agree on the basics. Of, of science on the basic truth, then we have a real problem in this debate, right? Being obese, unless you're a sumo wrestler, and those guys and girls, uh, or guys mainly, um, I don't know how the female sumo wrestlers, I don't think so. Um, so those guys are in tremendous shape. A sumo wrestler is as in tremendous health, is, is what I mean when I say tremendous shape. Um, those guys, are technically obese, as in their body fat percentage is quite high, but they have very little visceral fat because they, they train 8, 9, 10, 12 hours a day. They, they, their diet is all unprocessed stuff. Their diet is, is insane. Um, these guys are not to be found eating a Domino's, right, ever. <laughs> these are top-level athletes. It's the same as I was watching over Christmas. The world's strongest men, right? Those... Those guys are, and the same goes for, for strong-lived women, by the way. BMI does not apply to them because they, they all weigh 380, 400 pounds. Um, but they are in tremendous shape. The problem comes when that movement stops for sumo wrestlers. Um, if they stay the same size, they run into real difficulty. Most strong men die early because they're not tremendously healthy. Most top-level athletes, by the way, are not tremendously healthy. They are top-level athletes. They're always injured. They're always, and when we're talking health, we have to talk overall health, right? Right? Being obese puts more pressure and strain on the body than being non-obese does. Now, this is not me saying that a non-obese person is healthy or that non-obese people are healthier than obese people. I'm saying it's about risk factors. And the risk factors associated with obesity mean you're at an increased risk of various illnesses. Not that that risk doesn't exist for others. I, I usually, whenever I say something along these lines, I get an email saying, yeah, but my skinny friend got cancer. Listen, it's all things being equal. Think of the non-obese person as, you know, a person crossing a quiet road without looking and the obese person crossing a busier road without looking. Now, the non-obese person can still get hit by a car, but the chances of it happening to the obese person are significantly larger, right? And the more unhealthy obese, and again, I'll stipulate the unhealthy bit, the more unhealthy obese you are, the busier the road is. The more things that cause you genetic issues, like what uh, Dr. Larmy stated, the more genetic issues that you have, Poverty is also a thing. Of course it is. Right? We all know this. Uh, a level of education is always a thing. If you don't know how to cook and talk level of education, I'm not talking about going to uni and all that. Because clearly there are one or two doctors that don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> but I'm talking about level of, of knowledge. If you don't know how to cook, that's a real problem for health. Doesn't mean you'll be fat. No, of course it doesn't. Right? You could basically eat Subway every day uh, and have a salad every day and all that. It doesn't mean you're healthy. It just, lack of education has a real impact on health. Of course it does. Uh, especially if you only get your email, uh, if you get your health information from the Daily Mail. I think Dr. Mosley is right on everything. Right? Now, on their blog, they write things like, I'm not here to argue whether it's possible to be fat and healthy. That evidence already exists. And there are a number of books that have been written about it. Yeah, but nobody is saying that it is impossible to be fat and healthy. It's about risk. See, and it's statements like that that are the problem. Is it possible to be fat and healthy? Yes. Is it possible to be morbidly obese and healthy? Well, that's debatable. Uh, especially if you look at joint issues and all that sort of stuff. But sure, Lizzo always comes up. So let's use Lizzo as an example. Lizzo uh, moves around a lot and is going to be in better health, uh, better sh health, right, than um, uh, a non-obese person that sits on their ass and smokes all day, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Of course I will. Right? But just because books exist that say that it's possible to be fat and healthy, you know, not everything you read in books is true. <laughs> right? It goes for your blog. It goes for Game of Thrones. I mean, Game of Thrones is a book. The Bible is a book. 1984 is, you know, well, well okay, actually, that is pretty much true these days. Because God forbid you disagree with anyone or anything. Right? And then you look at silly comments on their Instagram page about losing, someone said losing three stones and my knee stopped hurting. And then they say, yes, this is what I hear a lot. Whilst at the same time, she then writes it off as anecdotal. Now, the science is clear that obesity causes stress on the joints. Any engineer will tell you this. That is the problem, or at least a massive contributor to the problem. No one in their right mind is saying that being skinny and losing weight solves all the problems. If you think that, then you've fundamentally misunderstood it. And if Dr. Larmy thought this for years and has now come to some sort of epiphany, and that almost seems to be the case, um, then they've completely misunderstood the science for years. But that is completely different from going to the other side and saying that there isn't an issue. Now, when responding to a comment that said something along the but exercise is good for you, they, could, they came up with an extreme example where someone is so disabled that they suffer from low energy and that might make them worse, which is just, I mean, why, why do you have to jump to the extreme 0.005% of the population? Right? And not they just accept that for 99.995% of the population, exercise is a good thing. And when somebody gets told to exercise by, by a doctor, the doctor will probably know whether they have some really weird medical condition that prevents exercise at any level. And exercise, again, we have to define what exercise is. Right? Most, by far, most people with disabilities need exercise. Of course they do even if they suffer from low energy. It's exercise that has to be adapted. Not all exercise is created equal. Come on, no one is saying to these low energy people, now that you need to do is high intensity interval training and get Joe Wicks on the phone and fucking book this in every morning for half an hour ago and make you feel better. No, what they're saying is movement makes people feel better. Stretching, helpful stretching, um, even assisted stretching and all that sort of stuff will make people feel better. That's what it's about. Don't stop coming up with extreme examples when someone makes a valid point. Right? Can we just can we just do that? You know, is being fat a task factor for any negative outcomes? This was another question that um, that they were asked. And then the, the the response was yes. And then their own comes as, you know, is that because of the impact fat has on the body? And then they said, no. In many cases, fat is protective. The negative outcomes are almost certainly due to the way society treats fat people. See for yourself, blah, blah, blah. And again, it's that oversimplification of the science, people. Because the comment is just not true. Fat is protective, yes, but only up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 the Daily Mail, it's the Daily Mail way of doing business. It's the Daily Mail way of putting science out. That is so fucking exhausting when it comes to this stuff. Daily Mail always has an article about once a week. Chocolate is good for you, right? Yeah, a piece of dark chocolate has components that are good for you. A glass of red wine every now and again is good for you because red wine has something in it. Something like that. Oh oh. But that's never what the study says, right? Too much red wine, you're an alcoholic. Too much chocolate, and that comes up with own, oh, its own health issues. Though, according to, you know, Dr. Mosley, you'll never be full. You know, and this is where uh, they, Dr. Larmy and, and Dr. Mosley are the same. They're both cherry-picking information and using shitty science, air quotes to make their case and, of course, money off the back of that. Dr. Mosley selling books. And again, Dr. Larmy, the blogs are behind a, a fucking paywall or Patreon or whatever it is. 
I always, I always ask people this question. If your message is so important, why isn't it free? But every, this goes for every activist out there. You know, I get asked this question a lot with regards to HPMB. Right? Why do you not make it completely free? Yeah, okay, it's costing me a fortune. <laughs> you know, I give it three months free. After that, it becomes completely a choice. It, um, also, whether you need it or not. I'll, I'll help you fix a problem for free. That's what I do. Because I think the message is important. Because I've always said this. Postnatal health is a right, not a privilege, right? So that means that the three months that you have, or 13 weeks or whatever it is, that other people charge you the world for, that should be free for people. Diastasis recti isn't a middle class problem. It's a problem for people who flip burgers, people with low disposable income, single mothers. You have got, you've got, you need this level of care, but you have better things to spend your money on, right? And this always, when I, when I deal with, when I look at pages by activists and they put things behind firewalls and Patreons and all that sort of stuff, I get very nervous. Because all you've done there or all you're creating there is a circle jerk of people that agree with you and that you can suck deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole where you'd no longer welcome honest and open debate about things. Right? Where you want people to stick to your oversimplified, incorrect message. That is my problem. I have no doubt at all that a lot of work needs to be done in the health of the size uh, movement and, and body acceptance and all that sort of stuff. It's important. And I agree, diet culture and Michael Mosley and all those guys are, are hacks. And, and, and we need to do stuff to stop these guys. But you can't do that with black and white messaging that denies fundamental truths for people's health. Can someone who's obese be healthy? Yeah, of course. However, you're more at risk of things when you're obese. Can we agree on that? One thing doesn't rule out the other. And you cannot say and quote a study that says <sighs> obesity is not a factor in COVID. And like I said, it's a shitty study. <laughs> it was a very early on study and it was definitely before Delta. Um, so obesity is not a factor. And then immediately say it is down to race and ethnicity when that same study says it's not. Come on. I don't feel I sound like Gordon Ramsay there. Come on. You know better than this. Right? Number three. And this will be a short one. Number three, because I did say it was going to be a top three. So... I I've, I've thought long and hard about this one, and I decided to go with the Bosch brothers. Uh, well, they're not really brothers, but you know, the guys behind Bosch, the company, I don't mean the, the power drills. I mean the plant-based food. And to be honest, again, it's not. It's never about the people. Like I said, they, the guys look lovely. I'd rather, I, I'd happily meet up with them. Same goes for Delicious, the Ella, and uh, the guy, the, the plant chef, uh, it makes off for Tesco, uh, Wicked, the, the, the guy behind Wicked, the chef behind Wicked. It is not about, uh, about the people here. Again, make that very, very, very clear. The problem I have with this with the products that they sell, with the, what I, what was it, what was it again? I did an interview a while ago, uh, December, I think it was. Yeah, because in December I did these things with uh, Juliana Haver. Uh, the plant-based dietitian, and she spoke a lot and very eloquently about the veganization of junk food, and that is that is the problem a little bit. This year, especially, obviously, veganuary is just finished. Thank goodness. Uh, so you can all go back to eating too much meat. Um, the um, the guys. The, the, the Bosch guys, they started off in YouTube and they're doing cooking stuff and it's all looked amazing and all that sort of stuff. And now they're essentially selling shitty cakes at Tesco. Uh, they do other things as well and I'm sure they do lovely stuff. And like I said, this is not about their products because that cake is actually edible, right? The cake is perfectly fine. My issue isn't with the cake. My issue isn't with uh, Ella's... Power balls or protein balls or whatever they're called. My issue isn't with the wicked burrito. Right? They're all, well, they're all shit in their own way. 
right? That's kind of what my problem is. The problem is the messaging around it is one around health. And that is, that is just not credible. You can bake a healthier version of a cake, sure, but that's not what you're selling at Tesco, guys. Come on. The stuff at Tesco still has a list of about 50 ingredients. Most of it stabilizes and, and E numbers, right? Just because you took out the eggs and the milk. <laughs> Come on now. Right? It's the same problem as I have with, with gluten-free stuff and, and with the... With, well, look at the deliciously Alice protein balls and all that sort of stuff. And I've done a little thing about that before. <laughs> yeah, they're made from natural ingredients. I, I don't dispute that, but they're still not a health food. Don't look at the Wicked Burgers that, that Wendy, uh, Wendy likes. It, it's, I buy them regularly for the jalapeno sliders or whatever they're called, jalapeno patties, whatever they're called. Um, compared to a normal burger, they're higher in salt, higher in fat, and basically higher in everything else that is horrible for you. <laughs> There's a list of ingredients longer than yarn, and they're more expensive than the normal burgers are. Now, admittedly, that is because meat is sold too cheaply, and most of the meat that you can buy cheaply is, is terrible meat for animals that have been treated very poorly indeed, so it's stuff you shouldn't buy. But, you know, why are vegetables all of a sudden more expensive? And meat is when they're processed. Right? That's the disappointing thing. It's because you, you attach a health message to it. When the health message around plant-based eating is based around, and we come back full circle to that protein leverage hypothesis and the uh, satiety, uh, satiety uh, theory, the benefit of plant-based diet, healthy plant-based diet, only exists if, and it's debatable that it's healthier than, than a normal healthy diet with meat, right? I'm not going into that debate. Um, but it only exists if it's unprocessed food. It doesn't exist when it's highly processed stuff that has been thrown in a cake with loads of shit and stabilizers and chemicals that people don't really need. I've said this before. Look at the pizza. I mean, I was, and this again, this, uh, you look at, uh, you go to the Tesco frozen section because, you know, I, when I buy pizza occasionally, I'll buy them at Tesco. And you look at the frozen section and, you know, when these gluten free and lactose intolerant and all that sort of shit. So we buy the, the, the good fellas, gluten free, vegan, whatever the hell. So the thing it is uh, for her, because I don't eat that stuff. Um, you look at the back of a list and there's still 70, 80 ingredients on it. It's pizza, for God's sake. Flour, eggs, water, tomatoes, cheese. <laughs> 70 ingredients. And it doesn't matter whether it's vegan or not, or whether it's wicked or not, or whether it's bosh and powerful superfood, whatever the hell it is. Dude, you're selling cake. Right, and again, this is not a pop at the guys, and the guys are lovely, and, and I, I like Ella, and I love the plant chef's amount of knowledge. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, but the messaging around it, the marketing around it is iffy at best. All month of Veganuary, in an effort to get people to eat a bit healthier and eat a bit more caring for the environment and eat a bit more caring for animals and all that sort of stuff. When you enter Tesco, there has been, at the very start, there's been a little fridge as you enter upon the entrance. There's a, there's a little fridge that is stocked with wicked stuff. Cookies, burritos, uh, other God knows what else. I always tend to walk past very, very quickly. None of the stuff that is actually any good for you. That's the problem, right? That's the problem with that messaging. It's sold as a good for you thing. I'm gonna do something healthy. I'm gonna do veganuary. And then you eat shit and you promote shit. It's the messaging that's off. And it's killing people. Like I said, Juliana Havers said this very clearly. 
only now is she and who was it uh libby mills who was another dietitian i had on and she's again next level expert guest by the way right these are not <laughs> these are people at the top of the game dr Cady burton um the functional medicine doctor they all say the same thing the quality of your food really matters and now that people have started veganizing shitty food junk food and taking the health out of fruit and veg which is an impressive thing to do you've taken the health out of food i mean who the hell does that right that that is the problem you cannot you simply cannot do that um, and then not be one of the worst people in the health and fitness industry because okay they might say yeah but we're not in the health and fitness industry no again you're not you're not in you're not selling health that's for sure right that's the disappointing bit guys that is why these three people what they represent are the worst in the health and fitness industry again nothing to do with the people uh, i don't know these people i don't care them and like i said i liked everybody i listed the number three i liked um the, the the messaging around this sort of stuff is way off and we have to be nicer to each other we have to stop selling shit that people don't need and stop telling people what they want to hear just because it makes us money right i'm just saying it would be nice stop cherry picking information from why not as a as a as, as a doctor mostly, why not put a book out that goes, yeah, I've been full of shit for 20 years, but how you can really lose weight healthily. If Dr. Mosley and Dr. Lamy could get together and remove all the all the fat phobia from his fucking books and remove all the nonsense from her statements and come together and say, this is how you can eat healthy and work together with the guys that bought to put together a nice healthy place of food, the world would be healthier. Currently, nobody is because we have one camp that says they need to go on a crash diet for 12 weeks. It's not very crashy if you do it for 12 weeks, by the way. And then you have other people that deny basic science when it comes to obese and uh, obesity uh, and other illnesses and risk factors and morbid obesity. And, you know, that says our oh, fat is protective. Yeah, come on now. And, and then you have other people the food industry and this again this is not the posh people it's not just the marketing uh the marketing guys and they, they might have sold the business already what do i know um it's probably owned by nestle right because those, those hacks own everything but if they could start selling healthier food that is not built around the cheapness and the false messaging then the whole world would be a much healthier place you know it, it just would be it's so disappointing it really, really is. In fact, and then we can get to the personal trainers that are hacks out there, of course. But a, a crappy personal trainer, a small personal trainer, does not have the same reach as a Dr. Michael Mosley has or a Dr. Laurie has. They just don't. And therefore, these three are my top three. Anyways, that also concludes my read past the label and all that sort of stuff for the week. Because uh, this podcast ran over <laughs> a little bit. You have a great week. Peter at healthypostnatalbody.com. If you have any questions, comments, and I know I'm going to get comments. Um, you know, I don't mind critique of my work. Critique my work. Right? Always. Just stick to the point. If you think I'm wrong about something, you send me an email. Peter at healthypostnatalbody.com. This is the point where you were wrong. Don't come to me and say, yeah, you're a jackass and I disagree with you. That adds nothing to the discussion. And I get enough emails of those <laughs> every week already from other personal trainers that want to make more money. Right? You take care of yourself. Have a great week. Bye now.